Good morning from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Upper Co. Today is the, is the last day of, of what I call the green season. Um, do, do, you, do you remember it, it, it's hard being green? Um, and, and by the time we get to the end of the green season, it sort of appears that way. That's <laughs> a very long season. Next week is Christ the King Sunday, and we're off and running towards Advent and Lent and Christmas and all that stuff. So, but, but it's a really interesting day today. We're going to hear from what is called the Prophet Daniel. Um, and, and, and what we're going to hear is, I will talk to you a little bit about the background of this story very late on in the history of Israel, before they completely disintegrated and headed towards the New Testament, there was, a, there was a Persian king who had conquered that whole part of the world and came into Jerusalem and did all kinds of really nasty things around the temple. And that caused, that caused the book of Daniel to be, to be written. Because it appeared um, that this king, Antiochus Epiphanes, was going to literally destroy everything. And so the people of God start asking themselves, well, what, pray tell, is God going to do about all of this? Um, and, and, and what we get is a, is a picture, it's the kind of picture that you get when when people start talking about apocalypses and that sort of thing, because they envisioned very soon the whole business blowing sky high. Well, of course, their view of what the universe was and what the world was and what their country was was very different than we have now. We have a much bigger picture. But, but at, at any rate, this is, a, this is a kind of end of the world vision because they conceived what was going on because of this king to be the end of the world. So we start, that, we start that reading this week and we'll finish it next week, but I'm not really gonna talk about the sermon itself so, uh, until next week. We begin our worship service this morning with, with an order for confession. If you will rise, please. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. We have built walls instead of tables and have turned away the stranger. We have sought glory for ourselves and have treasured that which does not satisfy. Help us to love as you love, to welcome those you send, and to treasure mercy and justice. Turn us from the ways of your ways and free us to serve those in need. Amen. God who makes all things new forgives your sins for Jesus sake and remembers them no more yours is the kingdom of God amen the first hymn for today is hymn number 652 
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, your soul and purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom come with your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. from the book of Daniel, Daniel, the 12th chapter. At the time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish, such as never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read responsively Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, and my good above all other. All my delight is in the godly and the godly man, upon those who are noble among people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods. Never, never take, take their names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My, my boundaries enclose a pleasant land. land. Indeed, I have rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me <laughs> night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your holy one see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second reading is from the book of Hebrews, the tenth chapter. Every priest stands day after day of his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would have been made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected all the time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. But he also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. When there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we, are, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary of the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have great priests over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. 
and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The Lord of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> According to Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, as Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what great stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. And when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when this will be, and what will be the sign that all of these things are about to be accomplished. Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines, and this is but the beginning of the birth pangs, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The disciples begin. Lord, Teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? Amidst a world of continuing change and turmoil, we human beings over and over again strive to find permanence. At least 25 years ago, the treasurer of Hope Church in Essex asked me, Pastor, when the time comes, will you be able to retire? Now, you've got to understand that this is a treasurer asking the question, so, so I understood all of that. And I responded confidently that the structure aim is aimed so that those who had spent 40 years working in the church, the 40 years that I expected to spend, would securely be able to retire. Unless, I said, unless the markets fall apart and then we'll all be poor together. Permanence is an elusive goal. But we keep trying. Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings some of you must remember, but this is a while ago. Back when the Cold War was, was raging on every May Day, <coughs> the Soviet Union would, would put on a huge parade in Red Square um, in Moscow. And they would roll huge rockets and tanks, and the armies would march down the street as if to say, this is permanent. That's what state religion at its most grandiose was all about. And they disappeared for a few years, folks, but they're back. And along with copycat parades in both North Korea and China, it's probably easier to see a Soviet state religion than it is to see our own. 
But we do it if for the least of eyes to be subtle. Do you see those great rockets? Do you see that great army? Here again, the disciples. Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Surely that is permanent. That will last forever or not. This week we're following the Mark and account of Jesus and his disciples leaving the temple at Jerusalem. The Jerusalem temple has a huge history, a history that in many ways will not end with its destruction in 70 AD. Surely you have the image of the Jews praying at the wailing walls in Jerusalem. Well, the foundation of the temple that's left behind when those big stones were all taken away is what's left and what the Jews call the wailing wall. That's all there is left. The foundation wall of the platform of the version of the temple constructed by Herod the Great. The Jerusalem temple has its roots in the tabernacle, that is the sort of tent church that was carried around by the Israelites as they journeyed from Egypt to what they called the Promised Land, and then would variously be moved around housing the, housing the Ark of the Covenant in its midst, and it was sort of like God was moving around with his people. But of course, the temple could never do for an upper cup and coming nation. After all, what nation has a tent for a church, much less for a temple? They had centuries of portable religious place. <laughs> But if they were going to be powerful, if they were going to be secure, they would have to have something more permanent, more predictable, more reliable. It was Solomon, you probably know, who made the first permanent temple happen. It was the prophets who would complain about it. We Whenever you build a church, we read that as a part of the, the part of the dedication process. Whenever, but we rarely read the concerns of the prophets about buildings who declared that God could not be shut up in one place, that a permanent place would not finally become a substitute for the hearts and the minds of God's people and for virtually the, for the vitality of a living God who travels with us. You know who won the argument? They built the temple in Jerusalem. It was arguably one of the places and things that strained the budget and the manpower of the kingdom that would cause within only a generation for the kingdom to be divided into two by rebellion. The argument went on. Well, if everybody worships in one church, then we all do the same thing and there is unity. But if we let everybody do their own thing wherever they are, then all kinds of crazy stuff can happen. A familiar struggle in our own place. The consolidation and uniformity over vitality and personal involvement. Well, when things finally did collapse, after the nation was destroyed and countless prophets had lamented the corruption of centrally controlled religion, it was the Babylonians who destroyed the temple, tore it down, took the remains away. And so when the Israelites would return from their exile in Babylon, they would 
build again a temple in Jerusalem. It wasn't as fancy as Solomon's temple. After all, things were tough. But they rebuilt the temple because it was a symbol of their unity. And then it was another Jewish king who, thinking that if he was going to be a great king, he had to have a great temple. Likely, he would have liked a bigger and better army. But Herod was a puppet king, and the Romans kept him on a short leash. So if he was going to be a great king, a temple would have to do. Coming out of that temple, after Jesus' conflict over temple practices, Jesus' disciples comment on the temple. They're like little kids coming in from the country to see the big buildings, you see. Did you see those big stones? Now that's permanence. Security that can be counted on. Nobody, not even the Romans, are going to be able to mess with us has the feel of a Cold War Soviet May Day parade. It's easier to talk about them than us. Surely if you've not forgotten the Soviet era May Day parades, or the last American president's insistence on doing our own version in Washington, do you see those great rockets and that great army and those airplanes? It could be any of us. Do you see those great buildings? Or maybe the houses we live in. Do you see those great houses? They are secure. We continue to search for permanence. You see that great pile of money. That's permanence. That's security that can be counted on. But of course it is not, and Jesus knows it. We ought to know it. We get used to our health and expect it to last forever, and then as if out of the blue, our kids are all grown up and everything is stable, and then there's a phone call. Perhaps you can imagine the content a whole generation of Americans retired early back along the road, and they would be comfortable, they thought. And then the economy collapsed and there was corporate corruption and pensions were cut by a third and much, much more. My generation counts on its 401ks, but who knows? And then I remember, then I remember my treasurer asking, Pastor, what of you? And I don't want to hear it. Not one stone will be left upon another, Jesus had said. It didn't quite happen that way because the Romans left those foundation stones that we call the Wailing Wall. But they essentially carried the temple away and destroyed it, and it was no more. Of course, Jesus didn't make that happen, but he knows enough about the foolish things that we rely on. He knows how disappointing our schemes ultimately must be. But here is the surprise. That's not bad news, Jesus declares, but it is the beginning of a better future, the beginning of God's future for you. And so out of despair comes hope, out of failure comes new journeys, out of death comes <clears throat> resurrection. If everything in your world seems cool this morning, if everything is copacetic, 
then Jesus' words might just not make much sense to you. But if things are bad and seem to be getting worse, if you are in that mode of, is there anything that I can hope for? Jesus' message is a proclamation that even when everything seems out of control, Jesus will be there. Thanks be to God. This past week, uh, two people who I know pretty well, whose lives seem to be chugging along just about the way they ought to, got bad news about health. Jesus' word for them is that no matter what today holds or tomorrow seems to fear, God promises that he will journey with you, that there will be light at the end of the tunnel, that there will be joy even when there seems only sorrow. Thanks be to God. The hymn is hymn number 438, My Lord, What a Morning. Again, 
he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Second offering, well, that kind of slipped through the cracks. Um, 
we will in fact do a second offering next week, but if you're not going to be here and you want to make a contribution to that, we'll put an offering plate someplace. Let us pray. Holy God, the earth is yours and everything in it, yet you have chosen to dwell among your creatures. Come among us now in these gifts of bread and wine and strengthen us to be the body of your word, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. It is truly right that we do this and we give thanks in these words. Holy, holy. You are indeed holy, almighty and merciful God. You are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for them all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, and his glorious resurrection and ascension, we await his coming again, and we give thanks to you, almighty God, not as we ought, but as we are able. In all of this we pray through your Son, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come now to the table that is prepared.
God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the holy and precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace to everlasting life. Amen. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you, in fervent love toward one another, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.